<clears throat> Welcome, I guess. Um, you're probably wondering what you're doing in here. What is a foothill garden? And I'm guessing that, uh, well, I won't guess. I'm hoping that you have some interest in um, different kind of garden, perhaps. So when I think of a foothill garden, this is what I think of. And I, it's kind of my name for it is uh, a garden that uh, is more natural than introduced, has more plants than it has rocks and soil. It also has a little bit of an elevation change. And we'll start looking at some examples here. It's less maintenance, less organization. And I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of like one of the Supreme Court called pornography. He says, I don't know how to describe it, but I know what it is when I see it. And that's kind of how I feel about a foothill garden or about a rock garden or about an alpine garden. They have lots of different names, and so I just choose this one. And as J.D. had mentioned, um, this year we've been able to go out and, well, over the past couple of years, and <clears throat> work with nature quite a bit and ph photograph it and, and just be out in nature. And it's been really nice. So I'm going to show you some pictures. I'm going to give you some ideas. But, but more than anything else, what I want today is it to be very informal. So I want... If I had my druthers, what we would do right now is we would all be in a van or in some place out in the mountains. And we'd be walking through and looking and talking about the plants. We'd be looking and talking about Mother Nature. Because that's where we find our inspiration. And that's where we find our beauty, in my opinion, is through what we see in nature. And that's what we actually try to mimic quite often when we do our gardens and make them look as beautiful as, as we see in nature. So what we're going to do is I'm going to start off by showing some pictures of <clears throat> nature, and we're going to learn together. We're going we're gonna to do this, vi this virtual thing, and, uh, you know, so you're going to look at the picture, and then you're going to visualize it, and you're going to close your eyes, but not for too long, just, you know, and then we're going to learn, and we're going to talk together as a group instead of me talking and explaining everything, because... I just like that better, and since I'm in charge, I get to decide. So, <clears throat> what we're going to, can you see that okay? Because as I say, we're going to pretend like we're walking out in to the mountains, and we're going to be learning from it, and we're going to be looking at it, and we're going to be talking about it, and you're going to tell me what you see. So here's a couple of places, is that in focus for you, all right? Here's a couple of mountain places, and I, what we're going to do is we're going to learn from Mother Nature. We're going to look at how she plants plants. We're going to look and we're going to see how she grows things and, and what the natural look is. So, anybody know where these two sites are, by the way? The one on the right is just right up here at, uh, I forget where I am. It's just Willard Basin. This is Willard Basin. If you have never been up to Willard Basin, you go up behind Manaway. And in about the end of July, 1st of August, go up there, and there are some beautiful basins up there. Willard Basin is a beautiful basin. There are some beautiful wildflowers up there. And the one on the right, on your left, is just outside of um, Rabbit Ears Pass in Colorado. <clears throat> so let's start. And I don't have a pointer. So we're going to start on the one on the left. Is there a pattern there? Do you see anything there that might suggests that Mother Nature does things in a pattern. Yes. There, there's not, is there? Yeah, there's, there's not a lot of shrubs there. You see trees, though, don't you? And they're kind of in the background. And keep in mind that when you're taking pictures, that you're looking at it from a perspective where you want to be able to see things. And so you could be looking at this from the trees going out into the meadow, but... That doesn't take a very good shot because all you get is the back of a tree. So I take them so that you can actually see the flowers and actually see what's out there. How about on the left? <clears throat> Let me point out a color to you. <clears throat> you tell me what it's doing. How about gray? Okay, is there a swath of it? Yeah, there is a swath of it, isn't there? And then what does it do from that swath? It kind of meanders out a little bit, doesn't it? Okay, how about purple? <clears throat> is it any strong in any one point? I mean, if we're looking at it. Okay. 
And that's because that's where you're standing. And yeah, it's just kind of a, just here and there. What other color do you notice when you look at it? How much yellow is there? Does yellow grab your attention pretty quick? Okay, actually when you look at that, you're almost drawn to the far end of the picture, and that's kind of natural anyway, but yellow is actually a, a color that grabs you, and yellow makes something look closer than it really is too, by the way. So yellow is one of those colors that will bring things closer to you, and that's why yellows and reds tend to draw your attention because it draws things to you. How about on the right up there at uh, <clears throat> Willard Basin? It's a smaller picture, but uh, even though, what's the dominant color in that picture on the right? Pink, but where do your eyes go? To the red or to the yellow, don't they? That's pretty typical. What's the most dominant color in nature, by the way? Green, what's the second most? Yellow. That's what I was looking for was yellow. <laughs> Work with me, people. <clears throat> okay. So we walked around the corner at Willard Basin, and we looked down on a little pond there. <clears throat> I think that's where this is. What, what, and it could be. I get confused. So what color are you looking at? On our, on our virtual tour, we can go anywhere we want in the world. So this could be the Tetons. This... <laughs> This could be the Alps. We'll, and if, since we're visualizing it, we can go wherever we want. We're going to go to the Alps, I guess. Although I've never been there. But what's the dominant color? So I, I get, my mind is weird. So what's the dominant color? Yeah, pretty much. What other colors do you see? Okay, kind of a creamy color. See any pattern? Any repeating something? How, where's purple? Kind of in the middle, isn't it? It's kind of strong, but then you, you see it here and there if you start to look. Okay. <clears throat> Nebo. Mount Nebo in, the, in probably July, June or July. See anything? Anything jump out at you? What? Tell me what you notice, what you like. Okay. Do you like that? Why? Okay. Does the little bit of yellow or orange help accent that <laughs> blue, that purple? Okay. That's pretty cool too, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, and what's really cool about this picture to me is, do you notice that purple is in, purple blue is in the open areas and yellow is in shaded areas? Okay, so does that tell you a little bit about some of the plants? Like, you know, th this is kind of how they migrate. They're not planted. This is kind of where they migrate to where they're comfortable, where they like. Um, and I do, Adrian, I love the white. And the other thing is, look at the trees. Are they just all in a row or are they all in the background, but we've pulled some of them out into us as well. And I think that that's very comforting. The other thing that I think is very interesting that in gardens we don't do and that we kind of shy away from, we're afraid of, is to use, and I talk a lot about this, but Mother Nature's really good about it, is using uh, the viewer's imagination. And so when you can't see it all, then your imagination takes over. And your imagination is always better than what's there. And... So your imagination starts to take over on what's beyond the trees, and all of a sudden the area becomes much larger. And that's one of the mistakes we make is sometimes whenever we put in a garden, we want to make sure that the viewer sees everything. There it is, you know, when in reality we don't want them to do that. We want them to be able to use their own imagination and see things differently. Because Mother Nature is brilliant at doing that. You never see everything. It's always a walk. It always pulls you through because you know there's something beyond. Um, there's delphiniums there. There's a uh, penstemon in there. But most of that, what you're seeing is a delphinium at that point. And we'll look at some of these flowers. 
specifically to. <clears throat> this, uh, I don't know where this is. But you notice that, again, it almost sometimes looks, this is what's cool to me. It looks yellow on the left, white on the right. And if you look real close, you can see a little bit of purple here and there. But then you can see that the white escaped over into the yellow side and the yellow kind of escaped over into the white side. And it's kind of like if you ever teach or, or watch kids um, when they're small, when they get, when, when they're real small, they don't care if it's boy, girl. But when they get to about 10 or 11 or 12, pretty soon if you get them into a class, there's boys and there's girls. And then pretty soon by the time they become teenagers, what happens? They start migrating back over, don't they? So this is actually true what happens with plants, too, is that as the plants and as the landscapes start to mature, you start to see this mixing. And, but normally it's very strong on one side. So you have maybe the boys on the left here, and then a couple of them are getting brave and moving over into the girls. And same thing with the girls getting brave and moving over with the boys, but still feeling comfortable around themselves. <clears throat> Um, I want to point out rocks on this, too, because we use rocks in landscapes, and we use plants, we use rocks, we use soil, we use trees and shrubs, and I'm not going to speak a lot about trees and shrubs just because of the time that we have today. I just want to give some overviews and some, uh, just have fun is actually what I want to do. That's kind of what my life's all about anyway. But tell me about the flowers and the rocks right here. Where are the flowers growing? <clears throat> Are there any on the top of the rocks? No, they kind of slowly work their way in as they can, as a little bit of soil blows in and moves. Okay, where did these rocks on the bottom come from? Did they roll down from the top, maybe? Did they break off, you know, a couple hundred years ago and then slowly have moved? Okay, so that's pretty true. And are they, is there any of much of a pattern to the rocks? Do you see any kind of correlation at all to them? There's a little bit. You can kind of see that the further that they get away from where they started, they, they spread out more. I mean, you can kind of see little pockets of them here and there where maybe a big boulder came down and then eventually broke apart. Because that's kind of how rocks work. They don't just line themselves all up, oddly enough. They just kind of meander, and as they fall, they break apart and then they become smaller. <clears throat> this is up on the Tetons, and um, tell me what you think about this picture, what this little landscape here. Anybody have any feelings towards it? Tell me some of the elements. What do you see? See what? Okay, dry. What else do you see there? Dead wood, live wood. I do, I see that. I, in fact, it's kind of an element to me. I kind of like it. How about anything else? Rocks? How much soil do you see? Quite a bit. Would you say maybe a third of the picture's soil? But you don't really notice that at first, do you? What do you notice at first? Okay, the purples and the whites. Are there weeds there? What would you call the weed? Okay, so are there weeds there? Are there any unwanted plants? You tell me. I'll bet if you walked right up next to it, you're going to find a couple of things that even on the Tetons that you would consider a weed. You are. <clears throat> However, you don't notice them. Is there grass in there? Yeah, there is. There's always grass in there. Is there, um, how many different types of plants do you think are in there that you're looking, if you were to make a guess? There's about 10. I can count. So sometimes it's, we're looking at the big picture here, and we're looking at the, you know, how do we view the world, and how do we view the garden, kind of looking at a big picture. And here's this, so we'll get through this. Another picture of you can see a little bit of purple and it's starting to move out. You can see that the white doesn't really grab you at first. In fact, I find that when I start to talk to people and then if I were to show you that picture and say, you tell me what colors are in there, 
white would be the last color you would put. And yet, if you look at that, it is almost the dominant color there. Okay, so we start to learn things about colors and about flowers. Um, purples grab you really quick. Yellows bring it closer, and they're also going to grab you very quickly, um, as are the purples. The greens, uh, the whites, they kind of blend, if you will. Even the oranges, a little bit, depending upon the type of orange that it is. Okay, so we're going to move on. Again, just kind of shows you, this is another thing that Mother Nature does, she likes to do, is she's really cool at this, is framing or um, having focal points where you will notice, oh wow, isn't that the coolest thing? I think that's a hadisram. But not only does the, it draws you, of course, this is where I took the picture, I know that, but then you have the focal point of the mountains in the background. So that's pretty cool. So we look at the macro, that's normally what we look at at first. And what I find with a lot of people is that they have a hard time figuring out, how do I do that? How do I design a garden that looks like that? And what we fail to realize is that that macro, that big site that we're seeing, that big garden that we're seeing, is actually just made up of a whole bunch of puny little gardens, puny little sites, puny little vistas, if you will. So it's the micro that I'm going to talk about more than anything else. The small scale, the individual plants, how we make them look good, how we make a garden look good, how we make it more natural looking, as if you will, a hillside garden type of an effect. For right here, and we're still going to talk about what we learn, and we're still going to talk about what I see in the garden. So <clears throat> here we see um, some bluebells and... What's the yellow there? I don't know. Helianthella or something. But I wanted you just to notice on this picture here that if I start to look at the small scale of things, of how I would plant them, how Mother Nature has planted them, how she creates this look, is she creates little pockets in rocks. And the pockets aren't always the place where the flowers are. If you'll notice, the pocket on the right is mostly full of grass. But you don't notice that. You notice the green. It has softened the rocks. You notice that things are growing in there. You also notice that the rocks are kind of piled up on top of each other. And then you have a real nice planting on top of them that soften the top part of, the, of that landscape. And to me, that looks... Well, what do you think? Is that, is that kind of a pleasant little picture there? Would you like that in your own landscape? If you were going to design a natural bed or a hillside garden? Is that kind of a, a vista or a view that you would want? Really strong blue, and then just a little bit of dabbles as it parts away from the main focal point. <clears throat> Using some other elements that Mother Nature uses that I think that we can use are, is, are, is dead wood. Um, the, the photo on the left it has a lot of white. It has a lot of soil, but it has more plants. You don't see, uh, if you look at it, what becomes the focal point on the left, by the way? What do you first notice when you look at that picture? Usually that piece of wood, isn't it? Why? Well, because it's different than everything else in the picture. This is also part of landscaping, is that anything that's different will become the focal point. It'll be what you notice and what grabs you. Um, how about on the right? What becomes the focal point? The rock in the middle, not the flowers, because the flowers kind of surround it and pull it out. So plants can do that to different objects and things. Um, look at where the plants are growing. I mean, they're just all around that rock. I think that's cool. Little nooks, little niches, if you will, for the plants. I think it's kind of, this is a white heuchera. Um, and what's kind of cool to me when I look at it is, you know, it, it just found a little place to grow in there. We all know that it likes shade, so it's, it's kind of finding its way. But look at, I mean, sometimes, you know, we have a tendency to not to want to put things. But look at the... Look at it back in underneath that rock, and even look at the flowers, how they're kind of bent 
and they're just kind of smashed in there. And sometimes we think that, well, when we plant, we can't do that to a plant, but look at it. Naturally, it's just kind of smashed in there. And can you see what I mean? The flower heads out everywhere else are really straight, but back in, in the rock, in the nook, they're kind of smashed in. But that also adds to the imagination as you look back in there, and it draws your eye back into there, and it's kind of a warm, cozy feeling. And that's, I mean, you kind of feel cozy for the, I do anyway, feel cozy for the plant, that it's kind of snuggled back in there and kind of pours out of the rock almost, doesn't it? Just kind of pours over it. Uh, again, you, you know, they grow anywhere. And the focal point becomes the flower here, as opposed to the rock here. And then it becomes the flower because there's more rock. Here's just some other nature shots. I like this shot on the right, how it kind of flows up. You have the pinstemon, and it kind of goes up to, I think that's a claytonia, and then on up to a heuchera. And, um, how the plants, I, plants are so cool. I mean, look at this stupid thing. <laughs> you can't grow there. And yet, it does. And it looks really cool. And so it's things like that that I like to try to bring into a landscape, into a foothill garden or into a rock garden, into an alpine garden, those types of things. Okay, so what do we learn from nature? Well, these are the things that I notice when I look at nature, when I look at her and I say, these are some things that to me, I really notice. I notice color. I notice the different, even on a small scale, I notice color. I notice color on a large scale right now. Mary Jo and I were coming up here through the canyon. What do you notice? Changing of the leaves. You get all, I get all excited about it now. All the different colors on the trees are just incredible to me. And do you ever notice Mother Nature say things like, well, you can't put salmon and yellow together because <laughs> it bleaches them out? You know, it, color is works. Now, there are some things, I mean, a yellow... And reds, as I say, kind of make things look smaller and they draw them into you. So if you wanted an area to look a little bit smaller, if you wanted to, to draw the eye somewhere, those are some of the colors you use. To make an area look bigger, you know, you're going to use your blues and your purples and, and whites, things like that. And it'll also make things look a little bit further away. But colors work. And it doesn't really matter. Mother Nature doesn't worry about if they're complementary or anything else. Colors work. Normally, Mother Nature, if you think of how she works, she normally has a plant, and as that plant grows or reseeds itself, then it creates a very good established area. And then you start getting these little escapees that kind of, like I talked about with the teenage boys and girls, and a couple of plants will start to wander off and roam off. So normally when we design some of these natural gardens, what we like to do is have established areas and then kind of dabble a little bit and have them escape a little bit out of where they're from, where they're naturally. But normally have a big pocket of them so that we can see, oh, there's that plant. Oh, look, it's escaping over here. Um, plants are opportunistic. They find snuggy places. They like that. They'll snuggle into rocks, and they'll, um, they'll also go in... Oh, well, I'll talk about that in just a minute. Okay, another thing that we learn from nature, I learned from nature, is rocks are not, always, are not all the same size. And, and rocks are thrown. They're not placed. You know, when I do planting, when I've done some, when we do planting at the botanical garden, and some of you know this, when Susie and Dory do their planting, they'll set out, when they start to design, they'll set out what they call a skeleton. So they'll put these, you know, plants that are randomly placed, if you will, but they'll be the structure of the garden. And then how's everything else plant planted? You throw it, don't you? And what happens if two plants land right next to each other? If you move them, I'm going to get mad at you. You plant them where they fall. And what does that give it? It gives it more of a natural look. It gives it more of a, a very soft look. Um, whenever we start to organize things, believe it or not, then it becomes, we become more uncomfortable. Now, it's... it's we like more of a casual, we like more of a loose feeling, more of an, it's more inviting. 
than something that's structured or something that's actually organized. So we like that. It feels a little more comfortable to most people, not everybody, but to most people. Rocks come from somewhere. It's what I tell people when they start to put in a water feature. I normally tell them water comes from somewhere. It just all of a sudden doesn't come off nowhere. I mean, there are some water features in Davis County that start from nowhere and end nowhere. And that kind of bugs me because that's not natural. I mean, water just doesn't all of a sudden, you know, walk through a lawn. I've walked through a lawn, and all of a sudden in the middle of the lawn, here's this water feature, and then it ends in the end of the lawn, and then I guess it goes back up into the lawn. And same thing with rocks. They normally come from somewhere, and they normally have a place where they come from, and then they kind of scree out from there. I mean, they kind of um, break up, if you will. They kind of fall apart, and I'll show you some pictures here. And then they create smaller pieces as they start to break down. And that looks much more natural to us. Plants develop niches. They like to go where they're comfortable, and they eventually move there. When we first started the garden in Ogden, we had um, Caryopteris, and, and I figured out we, we had a design, and the Caryopteris wouldn't grow there. They'd last for about two years, and then they'd die off, and then they'd show up somewhere else. And so I'd kill them off and replant them, and after about three times, I said, wait a minute, they want to be over here, they can be over there. And I figured out that plants sometimes know where they want to grow, and that's where they're going to grow, and they develop these little niches, and if we can find that where they like to grow, whether it's sunny, shady, whether it's, you know, whatever it is, then we're going to be better off, and the plants are going to be better off. And seasonal. Whenever we design the gardens, we want always to have some color out there and realize that each plant has its season. And they don't all have to be blooming at once, but usually, and that's usually not how nature works, they're all blooming at different times, and they have different uh, areas or different, yeah, times when that they'll look good. And that's okay, because then we are looking when they are looking good. That's what we notice. It becomes our focal point. Here you can see rocks. This is just to give you an example of how rocks kind of over time develop. And so you can see that you had a large rock. It started to break up. The bigger pieces are still kind of up around it. But as you go away from where that rock started to fall off, you, sm you see some smaller rocks. You see even some what we call scree as it starts to break up away from that. That's a very natural look. That's more of what you typically would find instead of just all. I, I just see a lot of people when they start to develop a a rock garden or a hillside garden where they'll go down to the quarry and get all the rocks the same size and then put them all the same size around there but that's really not natural looking and it's it's not what mother nature does now here's two um, examples of some rocks that were created by somebody uh, I see Bill just came in the door I think Bill created the one on the left and Richard created the one on the right these are both rock gardens these are both um, at the WD or at the Wetland Discovery Point in Kaysville. But I wanted to I noticed something, and if you look, I don't have a pointer, but you can kind of see how rocks fall apart. And then you can, if you look real close, you notice that you can see fault lines of how rocks break apart. And then once they break apart, you'll start to notice that that's where the plants will start to move into. And even if you look here, you can see a little fault line that comes across here and you can see it up here a little more obvious because of the camera angle here where Richard has developed that whole idea kind of a natural look of what the rock would have done instead of you know what you would have ex what you put down so very natural feels to it these are both new gardens so there's not a lot of plants in there so just look at the rocks here and then the scree as it starts to fall off of the rocks and then within the scree, what happens with Mother Nature is as these rocks start to fall apart, then we get wind storms, we get rain, but we get soil that starts to move in between these rocks. And then that's where the, those op opportunistic plants figure out, oh, that's what I like. They're going to go in there and they're going to start to grow. So we create these little pockets of areas for these plants. And that's how Mother Nature does it. And so then that's what starts to look natural for us. It starts to feel good. Okay, so that was just a real quick overview of my thoughts on the garden itself. I'm going to talk about some of my favorite plants.
that I think fit in nicely. And these plants are plants you can actually buy. There are some plants you can't buy that are actually my favorite favorites. For instance, um, Claytonia macariza. You, you can grow it if you're up about 10,000 feet. I think that's about its limit. It has to be 10,000 feet or higher. And I don't know if anybody has a house that high. But it's really a, one of my ultimate plants. And then the castileas or the uh, paintbrushes. I have seen them out there, and I have seen them, but they're kind of a hemiparasitic, kind of like to, um, normally they're found around sagebrush or grasses, and they're somewhat parasitic on that plant, and so it's hard for them to establish sometimes in our landscapes. Everybody wants them, and I, as I say, I have seen them on the market, but they're kind of a little bit difficult to find, and so when I talk about plants, I'm going to talk about some of the plants that you can actually get that are found in nature. And I'm going to show you some examples of how we use them. So before you ever grow or get a plant, and this, I don't care, I know I talk to people about trees and about everything else, know a little bit about the plant. And if you know the plant, then you're going to give it the right conditions. You're going to plant it where it needs to be. Um, most native plants are low water, but not all. And, and a lot of your foothill garden plants are low water, but not all. Some like water. Some like rocks, some don't. Some like shade, most don't. You know, so you create these little niches and these little nooks and crannies so that it accommodates these, some of these few plants. Antenaria or pussy toes. Um, there are a lot of different antenarias out there, and I'm just going to give you the genus. I'm, I mean, there's a lot of different species and different varieties that you're going to find. But Antenaria likes the full sun. And I didn't, I'm going to let you write down what you want to on the information on some of these. Um, really cool. It gets its name Pussy Toes because the little flowers look like little cat paws. And they're just, there's rosy, which is a real pink one. There's whites. There's all different kinds of very low growing. The plant is low growing. And then these flowers just kind of stick up, as you can see, up above the foliage itself. Okay, everybody knows Agastache. This is Agastache. This is our native Agastache sitting up at Willard Basin. Look at that patch. Is that incredible? That is just unreal to me. This is Agastache, but this is a cultivated um, plant. This is a, one of the varieties that we have out there. This is sitting at the greenhouse. You can kind of see the greenhouse there. But both of those plants, and you can find the native Agastache as well, when we went to Oregon about three or four years ago, we went to a place called uh, Terra Nova, which actually propagates Agastachys. And we were walking around with a guy, and he was showing us what they're doing. He says, well, you've got to come over here and see this Agastache. And I thought, what is an Agastache? Sounds like something that opens a bad door. <laughs> but that's how he was pronouncing. So I don't know how you pronounce it. I always call it. Agastache, but anyway, Agastache. It's a full sun. It starts to bloom at home. I have it starting to bloom in here. It'll start to bloom in July, and it blooms until it freezes for the most part. The, the native Agastache blooms a lot sooner than that. I have a little plant of it at home as well, and it blooms, I'm guessing, May, um, June in there, a lot earlier. <clears throat> Of course, Columbine, there's a lot of, I'm not going to talk much about Columbine, but I brought it up because shade-loving plant, or does pretty good with semi-shade, part shade. Uh, the Columbines are what they call uh, the whores of the plant kingdom. Uh, they they crossbreed with everything, so you can go out in the nursery and get about any color you want. Um, but there are a, a lot of different Columbines, and they're usually blooming in the spring. They like a little bit moist soil. They like a shady place. Astragalus are the milk vetches. There are so many astragaluses out there that I think, and Bill, you're going to have to correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there are more astragaluses than any other plant. Is that what it is, or is it? Yeah. So there are just lots out there. But what, what is really cool to me is look at the, you know, I talk about looking at the plant, but look how cool that flower is. Is that just not the coolest little flower you ever see? And they're really neat. So the astragaluses, they like full sun. They're usually blooming early in the year. 
um, or the milk vetches. All of those are within the same family, if that's what you mean. The astragalus doesn't get real viney. It's a very beautiful plant, in my opinion. Usually low growing. There are some uprights. Astragalus, I showed you one here, but normally they're low growing. Um, somebody was asking me about the delphinium. This is a delphinium that's sitting in, uh, where were we, JD? Rocky Mountain National Park. Look at that deep color on that. Isn't that pretty? Um, more upright plant, a little more moisture. So this is one of the plants that we can grow in a wet area. And it does quite well. In fact, that's normally where we'll find it is around waters, some water areas. The epilobiums are the fire chalice. There's a couple of them here. These, this one on the left is in my own yard. This is orange carpet, and you can see how um, I do use it to run down over some rocks there. I, and look at I use it right next to some turf because I do have a little bit of turf in my front yard. It's getting less and less, and Mary Jo claims that when all the kids are gone, I won't have any turf, and that may be correct. And on the right is a mountain flame, more of an upright, and that's also in one of our gardens. Um, it's blooming in the fall. This is when we talk about seasonal blooming. Normally it starts to bloom, you know, the end of July, 1st of August, and then we'll have it blooming for quite some time. So a little bit later bloomer. Um, the buckwheats, the areogonum. Now I didn't have a picture of it, but JD and Richard went over to uh, South East Oregon and have some pictures of one of these that is just as pink as you have ever seen. Just lays right on the ground and is just the prettiest pink I'd ever seen. And I didn't get to go with them and get those pictures. But there are, and this is another one that there's so many of them out there. But they're low growing. And look at where it's growing. This is the other thing I wanted to show you about these. You know, let's talk about plants that are, have persistence. It's growing right on top of that rock. So what does that tell you about that plant water-wise? I mean, there's not a lot there. And um, anyway, little, little clover-like flowers, very nice. Uh, wallflowers, another one I wanted to show you that's growing right on the stream here. And another plant that can grow in semi-shade to, to, to quite a bit of shade, as you can see it. And also, I've seen it growing. This is one of those plants that's so cool to me because I've seen it growing, as, a, as you see here on the right, right next to the water. But we've also seen it, if you go up Farmington Canyon, it sits right on that dry southeast exposed um, hillside and seems to do just fine. The hedistrum, the sweet vetches, again, what a cool flower. Um, very nice plant, blooming a little bit, uh, early summer, if you will. Of course, we know the heucheras, and we have some native heucheras, but these are, the other thing, cool thing about heucheras is we have some of the newer varieties that are coming in that have really cool foliage. Another plant that normally is grown in a shady location and sometimes when we think of shade, I've noticed this, I've noticed that when people think of shade, they think of moisture. And so whenever they think that a plant likes to be in the shade or can be in the shade, they tend to think that it needs water. Okay, what can you tell me about that heucher on the left in water? It's sitting in the crevice of a rock, and there's no way it's holding much water at all. So that's not always the case. And in fact, quite often it's not the case, and we need to be very careful of things like that, knowing about the plant as well. This is the uh, Missouriensis iris, but irises, beautiful spring color. And there are a lot of different irises besides just the bearded irises. I like irises because in the spring they have some great color, but I would never plant iris just by themselves, for my own opinion, because once they're done blooming, they're one of the ugliest plants in the world. And that's just my opinion. I grew up with rhodes. I grew up on the West Coast. And I love when, when rhododendrons are in bloom, but they're an ugly plant, in my opinion. They're not a very pretty plant when they're not in bloom. So you try to hide them. And the same thing with this. Yes, this is Missouriensis. It's a native. What now? Oh, OK. Lupins, really cool. I won't go into them. Penstemons, we already know how many different penstemons there are. 
So here's just a couple of examples of pincemans. I think that Richard tells me there's over 70 pincemans, native pincemans in Utah. And these are just a few of them. There's red, or, yeah, reds, there's whites, there's purples, there's blues. Just a lot of cool pincemans. Facilias, another one. You can see it growing a little bit of shade. You can also see it with some sun. Um, what a cool looking flower. It looks like it hasn't shaved for like seven days. And you got that stubble coming out with the little yellow on the end of the um, stamen, which adds just really cool plants that are out there that you can get. I won't talk about Phlox or Abecchia. Talked a little bit about Solidago. This is it left in, I think this is in the Ruby Mountains on the left. But on the right, it's Solidago in my park strip. And this is about a month and a half after it's bloomed. And so you can see that even though the, the flowers have faded a little bit, it still has an attractive look to it, in my opinion. It still adds some color, and it still adds some, um, I don't know, I just kind of still like it for the look of it as well. Feralcia, this is growing over. The problem with Feralcia are the globe malices. Sometimes they do get a little aggressive. You will see them reseeding themselves, but you can tell that it, uh, in the spring, early, sp well, not early spring, but in the late spring, early summer, they'll bloom, have a, one of the few really orange looks to them. Really nice plant. And then another one, this is in my yard too that I really like, is this Sun Dancer Daisy. And I wanted to show this picture up on the right. This is my park strip right by my driveway up on the right. That little Sun Dancer Daisy, the rock that's on the left of it is the water meter. So it's sucked between the water meter and the cement, and it's lived there for about two or three years. But this particular plant will bloom. It starts to bloom. Mary Jo, when did it start blooming? Like April? Does that sound about right? And this, was this picture on the left was taken about two days ago. It has bloomed like that all summer. And it, I just, I really enjoy it. It's one of those plants that to me, this has this yellow flower, and we don't, I, I don't deadhead it. Mary Jo will go out occasionally and deadhead it, but it'll just look like that throughout the year. So, um, so now, just to, just to end it up, I just wanted to give you some ideas of some other, how we use these plants and these rocks, and what some of the other gardens have done to incorporate it. Here's the Betty Ford Alpine Garden, and you can see the rocks, and you can see the plants that are just kind of pushed in here and there throughout the area, but you can also see the shrubs as well. We haven't talked really about them. And you can see that the rocks are different shapes and they're falling. They're not all organized, if you will. Here's another picture of some of their alpine garden or hillside garden that they have as well. And you can see some conifers in there, but you'll also notice some flowers tucked here and there. I think they've done a really nice job. Here's some heucheras within that same garden planted in there, the different colors. Um, Juniper Level Botanical Garden, I think it's in North Carolina. And I'm going to show you some good and bad things as well. I don't really love this, but what I wanted to show you here is that these particular plants in this part of the garden liked it dry and rocky. And so you can see that they've put the gravel out where, and they have the different colors or different sizes of rocks. And this is an area to walk up into as well, kind of see. So and one thing buggy that botanical gardens do is put tags on everything. So you see the tags. I mean, we need to, but um, anyway. Uh, this is kind of down the road. This is Ralston. They have a, what they call a scree garden. And you can see that it's just scree with the different rocks. I didn't really love that one. Here's part of their scree garden as well as you go out to the side of it. And again, you can see the gravel that they've put down because that's the niche that those particular plants like. This is in Portland, Oregon. This is the Berry Botanical Garden, which they mostly use rock at. And in the rock, they just put the plants in and around the rock. They also have some tufa troughs, and you can, I got another picture of them. But this is the penstemon bed, and so where they just have the different penstemons that will be blooming at different times. This is the back side of the Berry Garden, and all of their plants here, they put in these tufa troughs, and each little tufa trough is an individual landscape, if you will a macro setting of different plants. So you can go around and actually get ideas just off of these little um, tufa troughs, these little individual landscapes that are out there. Here's another example where they've just tucked the, the plants in there. 
This is a new garden in Colorado Springs that they're establishing where they didn't, it's, it's handicap accessible. So you actually have rock that you can walk around on and uh, it's very easy to get around instead of having to go through gravel. And then that, what they've done is you can still see they've kind of tried to incorporate the large rocks on the top and as they kind of fall down, getting smaller, having little niches for the, some of the plants that are there. Of course, it's a little more organized because you know, it's, it's handicap accessible. This is the Denver Botanic Garden, and this is what not to do, in my opinion. This is a children's garden. In the middle of the children's garden, they have ropes because they have these plants, these areas now where they're trying. It's a rooftop garden, by the way. It sits on top of the parking lot. But I thought it was crazy to have a children's garden where you had plants that you were trying to collect and grow, and there was little signs that say, please stay on the path. OK, I have raised children. <laughs> All that is is like saying, come stamp, stomp on my plants. You know, I thought, that's nuts. If I was going to do this, I'd probably do it somewhere else. This is out a little bit further away. This is their alpine, or what they call hillside garden as well. And you can see the conifers, but you can see the rocks placed sporadically around, and you can see the, the, the growth that's taking place. They have incorporated some of those little tufa troughs right in the base to create little microclimates for their plants. And then you can, again, see the rocks that they've placed around it as well. And then the last one I'll just show you real quick. This is the, what I know everybody envisions when they think of the, a hillside garden. You can see this is in Yampa. This is in Steamboat Springs. And you can see this little, we're we'll just looking at the hillside garden here, how they have the many colors coming into play. We have a yellow section, and then we dabble out from that. We kind of have a purple section, and we dabble out from that. Here's another view of it, where they've also got the sedums going in there, and I didn't talk about them, but a lot of the natives. But you can kind of see here, where you see that little bit of red as it winds its way through, the, through it, and then, and then the green, I don't know if you can see it as it kind of winds up there as well. The very mat-loving plants. So, and then the path that comes up through there. But you can also see the plants sitting on top of the rocks, in the rocks, and you can also see that you don't notice everything, that there's imagination it will even lead you up over the hill. Even if you couldn't walk there, your mind would go up over the hill and imagine on the other side something better. All right. Sorry, that was quick, down and dirty. So I was told about 20 minutes ago I have two minutes, so I'm guessing I'm done. <laughs> so thank you. Oops. <laughs>